do we live in an anti-Christian age? What are the biggest lies Christians are tempted to believe today? And how do we boldly and compassionately live out the gospel in our cultural moment? Our guest today, Dr. Rosaria Butterfield, has written a fascinating and thought-provoking book called Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. I feel like we have moved from a post-Christian mm. world into an anti-Christian world. And specifically, it's because of it's somewhat incredible. You and I have not really met and talked face to face until now. <laughs> I have followed your stuff for a long time, wanted to connect. It's good to meet you. So look forward to this conversation. Thanks for carving out the time to join me. Oh, the privilege and the honor is all mine, Sean. Thank you. Well, I'm guessing most people watching this are familiar with your story, but there's a good chance that there's some people who are not. And maybe they just need a refresher because this story really frames your recent book. So maybe just start off with giving us kind of a briefly summary of your journey to becoming a follower of Jesus. Right, right, right. And I think I'm so glad to start there because I know mm. that my tone is is um, much more direct in this book than others. And mm. it's because this is the world I helped create. Um, and what I mean by that is I lived as a lesbian for 10 years, but I wasn't just a quiet lesbian who you know just wanted to be left alone i was also a gay rights activist and i was mm. an activist professor i was part of the first crop of tenured radicals at syracuse university which is a tier one research university um, in the 90s and after my tenure book was written and i was pretty sure to get tenure i started working on a book on the religious right. And it was very simple. I simply wanted to know why people like you uh, just hated people like the person I used to be. It was a basic question. I'm not very sentimental. I'm an old Italian lady. I, you know, I don't mind if we disagree. I actually tend to, I'm an old liberal. And I genuinely believe where everybody thinks the same, nobody thinks very much. So um, mm. I, I didn't, I wasn't necessarily trying to be evangelistic or win everybody over mm. to my cause. I just wanted to know. And this was 25 years ago, remember, we used to say, leaving consenting adults alone. It's mm. important that you haven't heard that phrase in a long time, and we'll get back to That's that. That's true. So when I was an activist professor, I um, helped write policy. I helped write the policy in New York that, that rolled into the gay marriage decision because it was part mm. of the domestic partnership law. I spoke before the uh, legislature. My job was to make homosexuality look wholesome. Um, and I loved my students and I loved my partner and I did all of this because I thought I was gay and I thought gay was good. And that's just, you know, that was that. So in the process of wanting to study the religious right, I'm an English professor. So I actually have to do this thing called read, uh, which I enjoy doing, but I had to read the Bible. And I, I knew I was out of my league. I don't read Greek. I don't mm. read Hebrew. Um, I'm a 19th century scholar. So um, I, I, just very providentially, I wrote a uh, somewhat bombastic uh, editorial in the newspaper. It garnered a lot of uh, blowback. And one of the people who wrote to me was Pastor Ken Smith, the pastor of mm. then the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. And um, unbeknownst to me, through the ministry of Pastor Ken Smith and his dear wife, Floy, my life would change forever. And it would change forever because I would become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead of wondering why people like you wouldn't leave people like me alone, I would become thankful for the evangelism and not just the evangelism, but the community into which I was now enfolded. That did not happen overnight. It, sure. uh, my feelings, my lesbian feelings did not change in an mm. instant. I probably had 500 meals at Ken and Floyd's home. Wow. I read through the Bible seven times. I wrestled with things. I talked with Ken and Floyd. They very much were discipling me um, in love. And I was the recipient of maybe an older understanding and I believe a truer understanding of the gospel. First of all, Ken and Floyd did not, uh, their primary concern was that I was not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah. they made my homosexuality a secondary issue. This is also before a Obergefell, but I was an activist, so they knew that. But they knew that the biggest sin in my life is that I was an atheist. 
and that nothing could be built upon atheism. So that was helpful to me. They said at their first meeting that they could accept me as a lesbian, but they didn't approve. That might ring heavy on our ears now, but at the time that was fantastic. Somebody who would just accept that I wasn't a blank slate, that I wasn't faking it and all of that, that was hugely, you know, it was greatly comforting. Um, and when I became a follower of Christ, it was simply because I truly believed the resurrection was real and powerful. Mm -hmm. I didn't stop feeling like a lesbian at that moment. Okay. Um, I, I was not zapped, but what did happen <laughs> is that as I was following the Lord, the, like I take a little step towards him and I'd want to run back to where I was, but the bridge that, the Lord, that I had walked on, the Lord had destroyed. And so it happened in a series of things, betrayals, um, you know, loss of friendships, understandably. Um, it's a long story, but I don't want to suggest that it was an easy story. Mm. The church walked through with me every step of the way. But one of the things I've come to realize now is that at a certain point, homosexuality is a burden and a struggle and an issue. But in our particular climate, post Obergefell, post Bostock, um, um, changes in Title IX, homosexuality is no longer just about how some people struggle with a sin pattern. LGBTQ plus has become the reigning idol of our day. Mm. And as a former gay rights activist, the church can look to me as one of the people who helped make that so. Mm. so it is a sobering and complicated mission, but I do believe that I must speak into this at this moment. Thanks for that background. I definitely would recommend your book. I feel like I'm going to butcher the title, but unlikely secret thoughts secret of an thoughts. unlikely convert. We go into yeah. into depth on that. One mm -hmm. of the things that I love is that I believe it was Pastor Smith who sends you this letter. And it's about your article on Promise Keepers. And it doesn't mm -hmm. fit within the I hate you or you're awesome. There was a kindness and an openness that mm -hmm. invited that conversation. That's so much of the posture I try to take with people who mm -hmm. see the world differently. That's a story for another time. Now, this book, it's rooted in your story, but it's also mm -hmm. rooted in a confession. And as I read mm -hmm. the book, it seems like there's a confession about two things. Number one, there's kind of a mourning of the world that you feel like you helped create. But there's yes. also this confession of once you became a Christian, you held certain views that you look back on now and say, I also repent of those views. Is it fair that it's right. a confession of both? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And and uh, and maybe we should spell out what some of those views are. When I first became a Christian, I was very opposed to any kind of change allowing therapy, which is called either change allowing therapy or reparative therapy. And I was on the war path against it. Mm. And friends of mine, you know, spoke into my life and said, Rosaria, didn't you and Kent, my husband's name is Kent, didn't you and Kent adopt two children out of foster care with profound trauma? Yes, I did. Did you ever take them to therapy? Well, actually, I have sat in the waiting room of therapist offices long enough to knit whole sweaters. Fascinating, Rosaria. Why would you deny therapy for people for whom their homosexuality is responsive to trauma? Like, hmm. ah! So I repent of that. That is cruel. Hmm. I also um, repented of the sin of using uh, false pronouns for people who identify as either gender dysphoric or transgendered. This was more complicated for me because actually a very close friend of mine who was gender dysphoric was one of the people who was my biggest sounding board when I was first talking to Ken Smith and reading the Bible. But what I came to learn, again, post Obergefell, post Bostock, the reason I'm saying this is that I understand God is you know, not constrained by space and time, but I am and you are. Um, and so, so um, I came to learn that using cross, using false pronouns, which is called social transitioning, is especially harmful for minors who are struggling with their gender identity, whether it's either on the side of gender anxiety 
which is dysphoric, a little bit like anorexia, mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, I hate my body, or whether it's part of the social contagion, uh, which is part of um, a world that says the only way to be a decent person is to be an ally to the LGBTQ plus movement, mm. especially for young women, that role of ally um, inculcates a kind of empathy and support that is very hard to navigate if you're 14. And so all of a sudden, out of seemingly seemingly the blue, we're seeing one out of four uh, young girls, teenage girls, um, uh, believing that they're really boys. Um, and they call that rapid onset gender dysphoria. And that is located in a mm. social contagion, very much like anorexia can be, you know, the entire, mm -hmm. I used to be a gymnast, the whole, the whole gymnastic scene became mm. bulimic and that's mm. something's not, something's going on there. Um, mm. And so I realized, I mean, not only was it a violation of the ninth commandment, but it was actually doing the opposite of what I was trying to do. I was trying to be missional. I was trying to meet people where they are. I wasn't trying to fast track people to mutilate their bodies or to take hormones that would um, that would really del deleteriously affect their their lives and their futures. And so I repented of that. I repented of that sin. And then I also repented of some other sins that um, that really had to do with. I guess kind of using slogans instead of the Bible, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. you know, kind of like mixing sure. my my theology with all kinds of stuff and realizing, wait a second, no, I really do believe that this Bible is my guide to faith and life. And, and even more than that, as somebody who was shocked to realize that my mm. indwelling sin was so powerful that I couldn't really think my way around it, uh, without the Lord's help uh, to realize mm. that this Bible actually knows me better than I know mm. myself. The, the way a friend of mine put it to me once is, is that, um, you know, when we read the Bible, we sometimes think that we're like, we're like in biology lab and we're dissecting the fetal pig. And then after you realize what's actually going on, you realize, no, you are the fetal pig <laughs> and the Bible is reading you. And that was very much uh, very much what I experienced. So yes, I start with That's, my confession, and I will mm. tell you that people, I, I, that I have not received overwhelming, uh, you know, praise and thanks for that. Mm. Um, I uh, before I did this, I spoke with all of mm. the people because nobody sins alone. Nobody ever sins alone. Mm. So I, I talked with all of the people, you know, other writers, other thinkers, dear friends, and to a one, they said, "Well, can't you just course correct?" You know, like, can't, can't you just stop doing that and start doing something else? And I thought about it. I really, I, mm. you know, I love my friends. I, these are Christians. I, I wanted to take their advice seriously. And I came to the belief, and this is, I talked to, obviously, my husband's a pastor and, sure. um, you know, my session. And so I talk with people and I just came to the position that it's fine to course correct if you just make a mistake, you know, like later today, I'm going to take a child to, a, you know, a, a sports event and, you uh, I'll probably take the wrong exit on the highway because I'm me um, and I will have to course correct. And it's not a sin to do that, but it's a sin to violate the ninth commandment. It's mm. a sin to deny people the care that they need. It's a sin to uh, it's a sin to, to, to manage the Bible in a way that is wrong and wrong headed. Mm. And it doesn't matter that I had good intentions. It's a sin because it's a sin, not because I intended a sin. I don't know any Christian who wakes up in the morning and says, oh, please let me sin today. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> it's absurd. So I did start with repentance. And, and another reason I wanted to start with repentance is I do wonder, and I'm sure you do too, why isn't God blessing the church right now? Mm. Why do we feel like we're mm. really losing ground? Why do all the women who write to my website or stop me at Costco or come to my church the burden is a prodigal child. What's going on? Why isn't God hmm. blessing us? And I think it's because we have Aiken in the camp, and I was one of the people hiding, wow. you know, the, the booty under under uh, the dirt. So, um, so that's that's right. I start with repentance. That, that's super helpful. Now we're going to come to your five lies, but I'm wondering if I can just kind of probe in to get a little clarity on your your mm -hmm. position on pronouns since you mentioned it a little bit. 
So let me give you an example that might help. Years ago, my dad shared with me a principle that he would refuse to speak to a segregated audience racially. And okay. that's not so much an issue now, but 60s and 70s mm -hmm. when he started, at times it really cost him something. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this might have been a decade or two ago. I started pressing him. I said, Dad, what about other evangelists that have done that? And he stopped me and he goes, he goes son, this is the conviction God has laid on my heart. That's mm -hmm. between them and the Lord. And I thought, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. There's a time where I confess my sins and say, others need to do the same. Or there's a time I just say, I was wrong here, and I'm speaking my conviction before the Lord. Right, As, right, right. So this confession that you are making, is this saying, I'm just speaking what God has laid on my heart, or is it wrong for any Christian, any time to use a preferred pronoun in any context, yeah. and you're calling others to do the same? Exactly, yeah, it, it is definitely the latter, and here's why. And I appreciate your dad's um, graciousness in that situation. The analogy isn't, the analogy doesn't work. Um, okay. uh, people who experience either the medical condition of gender dysphoria or the um, social contagion of transgenderism are not a people group. They're not a sexual minority. They're not a people group like a racial minority. They are mm. a particular group of people who are burdened under an indwelling sin pattern. Now you might say, but wait a second, wait a second. Isn't you know gender dysphoria a, a medical issue? Well, I believe it is. I mean, I'm I, and I you know there are a number of reformed people who would disagree, but I think it's a medical issue insofar as it has a, a, a you know a diagnosis in the in the American uh, Psychological Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. But what you do with it is really important. And if you start on the path of social transition, hormonal transition, medical transition, in a post Bostock world, that path is like a fast moving escalator. And it does often does not give people the time that they need to count the costs of these profound decisions, these life changing decisions. Um, and so so no, I am not, I don't believe in the, it's a sin for me, but it's not a sin for you. If that were the case, I would just course correct. And I would quietly mm. kind of work it out on my own and talk privately with my friends like Christopher Yuan and other, you know, we, you know, sure. we are all in this together and we have our little, sure. you know, I, I, but no, I believe it's a sin because what you are indeed doing is you are affirming something that is itself a sin. It is a sin to go to war with the creation ordinance. It is a sin to declare that God's created order is indeed evil or wrong or not true. And it is also a lie. Hmm. So no, I did call others out and uh, to repent with me and as you and I both know, I live a lonely life, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. More than anything, I wanted clarity on your position yep. and why, and that helps. So at the root of it, it sounds like it's two things. It's a lie, misrepresenting something. Christians should never lie, should never deceive. And then second, behind using a preferred pronoun as well as its intentioned there is an entire worldview and a movement that is contrary to creation. And just using that, even in a personal relationship, is contributing and allowing that movement when Christians are called to resist it. Is that and fair? And one in terms more thing. Of, okay. That's totally fair. And one more thing is that the LGBTQ plus movement is the reigning idol of our day. Mm. And in the same way that you are not called to sacrifice your child to Moloch, I'm not called to sacrifice my friends to this idol. This mm. is not a pre Obergefell world where someone could quietly, I don't know, kind of engage in maybe a, a fiction or a, a kind of delusion. In this particular world, we are in a very barbaric world. People who are either sick with a dysphoria, and just think about it for a minute, the medical analog to gender dysphoria is anorexia. 
if you had a daughter with anorexia, you are you would not think a sticker in a parade would help, nor would you think that affirming her false view of herself would ultimately be a good solution. It just wouldn't. It wouldn't. That you know, it 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 would seem quite frankly barbaric. But part of why we don't think it's barbaric is because we haven't. I don't think the the evangelical church has really stood close enough to people who have indeed transitioned and now regret it. And and just so you know, I mean, I I'm mostly a mom and a grandma and a pastor's wife. Um, I do understand that when I do speak, it's controversial enough that it appears that that's all I ever do, but that is simply not true. Um, and so, like, for example, days after the Liberty University address, which we're all still spinning from, I was speaking to my local school board, um, which, you know, I live in a very blue, 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 uh, you know, county. And uh, I had hard things to say to my school board about transgenderism and parental rights. And then uh, what I also do is invite people over for dinner who disagree with me. And Kent and my children and I sit down with people and we talk and we share the gospel. And then, you know, later in the week, I'll bump into school board members who were mad at me on Tuesday night and we'll enjoy a nice time walking our dogs. And that to me is how grownups and Christians live. We speak the truth, we say the truth, and when our relationships are as strong as our words, all kinds of good things can happen. Mm. So I think part of why Christians are so afraid to speak forthrightly in this world, to say just exactly what I said, it's a sin, no, don't do it, is because th this Christian world seems to be so enamored with a kind of social media infused way of relating to people. Well, I, I don't relate to people that way. I relate to people by having dinner with them, by spending private time with them, hmm. um, by getting to know them as as people. And um, and I think in that situation, when you are genuinely in people's lives in real ways, your words can be pretty strong. Hmm. And the gospel is a pretty strong word. Don't we agree? Amen to that. Amen to that. Now I've got I got so many more questions for you on this, but I want to get okay. to your your book uh, well, again I, on, on on five lies of our anti Christian age. One of the first things that stood out to me is that you describe our culture as anti Christian. I got mm -hmm. another book in the mail yesterday that also described our culture as anti Christian. I'm curious, did you pick that? Did the publisher pick that? What do you mean by that, and why that designation? Yeah, I know I picked it. And when I wrote Gospel Comes with a House Key, I called that, so that the, how, Gospel Comes with a House Key was published in 2018, but it was actually written in 2016. So a Burgerfell had, you know, we just kind of had yeah. a Burgerfell, but we hadn't white, you know, like the, the mm -hmm. dust hadn't fallen. Um, and I called that a post-Christian world. Oh, interesting. And, uh, okay, so I feel like we have moved from a post-Christian mm. world into an anti-Christian world. And specifically, it's because of the Obergefell decision, which not only legalized gay marriage in all 50 states, but also included a dignitary harm clause, which basically meant what Pastor Ken Smith said to me, if you said that to me today and I were back in my old self, it would be considered a bigoted harm. Because what Pastor Ken Smith said to me is, I can accept you as a, les as a lesbian, but I don't approve. The Dignitary Harm Clause says to fail to affirm someone's mm. LGBTQ plus dignity is itself a harm. And so, okay. um, and then add to that now the Bostock decision that came in 2020. Yep. We were so busy disinfecting our counters that we didn't, we missed that one. But that was where LGBTQ was added to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And okay. that's what caused the change in Title IX. So when people say things like, listen, leave me alone. I want to use preferred pronouns and I'm a Christian. It's just a matter of vocabulary. Or I want to say gay Christian. It's just a matter of vocabulary. Well, people don't get fired for their jobs from using vocabulary. If, if, if it's vocabulary with a civil authority that stands behind it and can punish you for using it, it's not just vocabulary, it's an ideology. What uh, the Marxist critic Raymond Williams would say, the difference between a word and a keyword. So mm. in a post-Christian culture, 
a word is a word. I have, I don't know, four synonym finders over there because I'm a wordsmith and I love words. But um, a key word is a word where the civil magistrate enforces you to either use it or not use it. And that's what you're seeing right now with the whole plethora of LGBTQ plus um, signifiers. So I was turning to the section in your book that you were referring to where you said related to the 2015 Obergefell decision, the -hmm. court did not expand the definition of marriage to include gay couples. Now, I thought the next line was going to say it changed marriage to a sexless institution. I'm sure you would agree with me on that. We often hear... We often hear that, oh, they just expand it and now allow gay people to get married. And my pushback mm-hmm. is, no, we actually changed what marriage is. It used to be essentially right. a sexed institution. Now mm-hmm. it's genderless. But the next mm-hmm. line is what you're saying is the root of why you consider our, Christ- our culture anti-Christian is, quote, the court declared opposition to gay marriage a discriminatory act of animus and hatred. So built mm-hmm. into the Supreme Court is if we don't yeah. accept same-sex marriage for whatever reason, good intention, loving my neighbor, faithfulness to scripture, that by definition is considered animus from the government down, hence anti-Christian culture. Does that capture right. where you're coming from? It, okay. it does. And I'm so glad you mentioned the difference between sex and gender, which is a very modern idea. This microphone is sitting on an uh, Oxford English dictionary that's so old, it doesn't even have that distinction. It understands gender to mean genesis, to mean um, a biological Mm -hmm. term for how something is reproduced. And so the sex gender distinction was a very significant 19th century feminist introduction that challenged the idea that when God created man and woman, he created us with a pattern and a purpose. So God isn't some like mad engineer, he creates a bridge and dives into a bridge. No, there's a pattern and a purpose And um, what's so interesting for me today is that that sex gender distinction in as it's as it's moved throughout the generations, uh, you know, from 19th century now to the 21st century with transgenderism, all we have is gender and we have no sex. Mm. So that, that, you know, it's interesting to me how a category mistake can really set people up to not know themselves. And ultimately that's the most amazing thing about being a Christian. Being a Christian is you get to see yourself as God sees you. And then you get to be what God wants you to be. And that is astounding. Um, But I think there's also an issue beyond it. And if I could just quote to you from something, I did not write this book. It's the New Reformation Catechism on Human Sexuality, uh, Christopher Gordon. This is uh, Christopher Yuan's pastor, actually, he wrote it. Oh, um, interesting. And, and so, he, so there's a question. It's written like a catechism, so it's question answers. Here's the okay. question. Aren't we able to make a distinction between biological sex and gender in search of our identity? It's a very big question today, isn't it? That's an important question. No. God established a natural order in the creation of male and female that is good for us as image bearers of a holy God. And so I hope we can talk a little bit Mm. about image bearing. To introduce gender as a new category of personhood, separate from the biological category of sex in pursuit of a different sexual or gender identity, is unnatural to the creation order and harmful for the purposes for which God made us. And so as uncomfortable as it is for Christians, most Christians don't want to be troublemakers. We don't want to, we don't want to be, we truly want to live a quiet and peaceful life. But in a world that says you must affirm something that is not true, or it is kind and decent of you to, um, to go along with what your culture says is, is the new world order about marriage, you know, the reason you can't do that is because you're actually called to love your neighbor and putting a stumbling block because you're between your neighbor and the God who made her is um, it's hateful. Mm. It's unloving. It's Mm. unkind. And so that's where you really have to realize that your job is to love your enemies, not pretend your enemies are your friends. Mm. And but what Ken and Floyd Smith did for me is they they loved me. Um, 
I mean, I was their enemy. I was the enemy of Christ. Mm. And um, for me, coming to that realization was a profoundly important juncture in my Christian journey. Um, it it put into play what Thomas Thomas Chalmers calls the um, uh, you know the disruptive or you know affection uh, you know the what is it called the Im impulsive um, the new affections that that you know I have these new affections and I I can't not have them um, but they don't they don't correspond with my old affections and so um, I, I think what what's what's you know it was just a powerful moment and I would say mm. it was the moment that I felt the fear of God as the mm. beginning of wisdom not as a bad thing. I mean, it was in a very safe home with people who actually loved me, but mm. they told me the truth. Mm. I love that. Grace and truth runs through your book, which is something I try to model and live out. Yeah. Don't get it perfectly, that's for sure, but that's the task we are called to. Right. Uh, so t tell us maybe quickly, we won't have time to get into all these, but what are right. the five lies? And I'm curious how you picked these five lies as right. opposed to yeah, yeah, seven yeah. or 10. Well, or maybe others. I should tell you how I picked them first and then okay. tell you what they are. So Sounds I picked good. them because I had so many moms and grandmas stopping me at Costco or stopping me at church or stopping me and I'm walking the dogs and saying, if Christ isn't divided, why are Christians? Um, mm. My church says we need to major on the majors, but we can't agree on what the majors are, what's going on. And so I really sat down and I thought about it and I, I came up with three reasons that unleashed five lies. And the three reasons are, we have failed to understand the importance of the Old Testament in our lives as Christians, that we have failed to see that the seeds of the gospel are actually in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the way one person, one book puts it, no Adam, no Christ. Uh, the second is we fail to read the times. We act as though it, it doesn't matter that um, a pronoun usage has a material force that could land you in trouble with your job. It, we have no, we, we haven't thought about what it means to actually be in a post-Christian world. And we haven't thought about how do you share the gospel in a hostile world without being hostile, but also without being somebody who is um, just simply carrying water for the other team. And then the third is that we just we have failed to actually love our enemies, and instead we've been happy with their common grace, happy that the you know women who identify as lesbian across the street walk their dogs and cut their lawn, and you know we're settling on common grace, and that unleashed these five lies. And what all of these five lies has in common is that they all have something to do with what it means to be an image bearer of a holy God, hmm. and what it means to rebel against the single most highest uh, appointed dignity that a human being can have, and that is image bearing of a holy God. So, um, so you know, in the same way that everybody's talking about critical race theory and critical theory, I have a PhD in critical theory, I could write about that, mm. but I don't happen to think that's the biggest issue of our day because to get that wrong is a little bit like having a broken leg. It's bad, don't try to run a marathon on it, but you'll, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna make it. But if you get the creation ordinance wrong, that's like having a fatal heart attack. Mm. And that's where we're going. So first lie is the lie that, that homosexuality is normal for some people. It's a normal sexual variant. The second lie is that pagan spirituality is kind and decent and biblical Christianity is harsh and unyielding. The third lie is that feminism is good for the church and the world. The fourth lie is that transgenderism is a normal gender variant. And the fifth lie is that modesty is, is an outdated, uh, you know, outdated expectation, mm. and it's really dangerous for women. It, it sets women mm. up to be abused. And what all of those lies have in common is they pervert in some way what it means to be an image bearer of a holy God. To be an image bearer of a holy God, you are male or female. You, 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 that's it. You're male or female. And you know what? If your indwelling sin, like my indwelling sin, was uh, you know homosexuality, you're still either a male or a female. And if you struggle against uh, gender anxiety, just in the same way that if you'd struggle against anorexia, you're still a male or a female. Mm. And so, being made in the image of God means we we need to grow to be more like God not more like our sin. We need to grow to be more like God, specifically in knowledge, 
and righteousness and holiness. But transgenderism and homosexuality come from the world, the flesh, and the devil. So to say, no, I'm made in the image of God as a lesbian, is just not true. It's not accurate. It, 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 it It's a category error. Mm. And it's ultimately not helpful for me in drawing, drawing closer to the Lord and growing to be like the Lord. I have thought for a while that anthropological questions are at the root of what some of the deepest yes. cultural divides are. What Absolutely does it mean right. to be human? Where do we come from? Is there a design for how we're supposed to live? Do our bodies mean something? And of course, right. you very quickly can't answer that question without getting to where did we come from? Some blind evolutionary process, some creation right. account, however God created. So I agree with you on the central question related to origins and what it means mm -hmm. to be human really divide our culture today. Well, I, I, I think we could do two hours on each one of these lies, but let's jump in the first one that you have. And the specific title you wrote is that homosexuality is normal. And you write, once gay, always gay. Now, there's a direct quote I want to read to you and then ask if you could unpack this for us. You said, homosexual orientation is a man-made theory about anthropology. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you mean by being man-made, maybe some of its Freudian roots that you discuss, mm -hmm. and how that contrasts with a biblical view of what it means, a biblical anthropology. Right, absolutely. I wrote about that extensively in a... 2015 book called Openness Unhindered, and Christopher Yuan has written about it extensively in his book, Holy yeah. Sexuality in the Gospel. So there's a lot of terrain already out there. But sure. the idea is this, um, sexual orientation is a man-made category. I mean, insofar as, you know, if you study the history of ideas, you can look it up in the OED and say, ah, where, where did it come from? Ah, it came from the 19th century. Ah, it came from Freud. Um, and it came from specifically the idea that who you are is wrapped up with how you feel and that you are the in some ways that you know you are the person who best knows who you are you are the person your feelings are true and they're accurate and they're good um, and that is not a biblical idea you you biblically speaking homosexuality uh, comes from the flesh the fallen flesh um, it is uh, forbidden in the law, multiple places in the Old Testament and uh, corresponding connections in the New Testament. And praise be to God, it is overcome in the gospel, overcome in the Savior. Now, um, if I believed that my lesbianism was either... Um, a kind of sinless sexual orientation, a little bit like maybe being left-handed or you know being sure. Italian or whatever, <laughs> then I would never repent of it. I wouldn't need to. Yeah. Or if I believed that my homosexuality was a, a, a temptation, but not a sin, not a sinful temptation. And if I would use verses like, well, Jesus was tempted in all ways, and it's just a temptation. It's a, it's not a sin. Get off my back. Quit, you know, don't lay heavy burdens on me. Um, on the one hand, I'm very sympathetic to those ideas because I once believed them all, and mm. I can remember feeling that way. Mm. But on the other hand, it sets people up to fail. And if mm. you look at James 1, what you see there is the life cycle of sin you know like in the same way that you have like those life cycles of the butterfly in your you know your kids you know bedroom when they were five you know the life cycle of sin and so so internal temptation same-sex attraction for some of us right i mean praise be to god i was not sexually abused so it didn't come mm from some kind of an, and I praise God for that. It did not come from sure. external trauma, but it, it came from something and it did not come from God. It came mm -hmm. from the particular way that the sin of Adam shapes me. And, and the question then for many evangelicals is, am I responsible for the sin of Adam or am I a victim? Am I a sinner or am I, not? or am I a sufferer? I mean, I know the answer is yes, 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 yes to all of that, but the sure. order is really important because here's why. When it comes to fighting sin, when is it easiest to fight your sin? When it's small or when it's big? Hmm. 
Okay. And so if I'm told by, um, by evangelicals that I don't need to fight my same sex attraction because it's not a sin, get off my back, Sean, Rosaria, get off my back. It's not a sin. And I don't fight it then. And I wait until it becomes a monster. How is that going to go for me? Like, seriously, I'm a pretty weak person. How am I going to fight a monster? Am I going to win? Probably not. I've, I've actually tried, so I can tell you I don't fight monsters well. So internal temptation, hmm. the sin for which I'm culpable, according to the fall of Adam and, and the Protestant understanding of sin, same-sex attraction is a sin over which it is a temptation. It is small. It is like, Think of it like an embryo. And then lust, desire, actual sin, obviously those are more extreme examples of it. And obviously those, are, those have greater culpability. But if I learn how to fight my sin as an embryo, I might have to still fight it a thousand times a day. And I might need to get up tomorrow morning and do the same thing. But over time, I will experience what we call um, progressive sanctification. And we aren't, um, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a reformed Presbyterian, so we don't do faith healings. We don't believe that, uh, you know, I have not yet been lobotomized and I suspect you haven't either on your sin patterns. Um, but we do believe the way the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it, I love this language, your sin will be sufficiently subdued. Okay, mm. in other words, it's not you. You know, and you think about something like, like, you know, the compassion of God in giving us the Bible and something like Romans 7, where Paul says, why do I do what I don't want to do? It is the law of sin in me. That's his way of saying, this isn't who I am ontologically. This is how I am just currently like smashed under the rocks of my indwelling sin. And to me, any Christian who denies um, a fellow human being the opportunity to repent of her sin when she has a chance to beat it is doing Satan's mm. work. Mm. And this is where it gets tough, and you and I both know it, because get behind me, Satan, is something that Jesus said to a beloved apostle, right? You know, So mm. it could be that you're doing Satan's work Oops, accidentally, you know, and if and if that's the case, you correct. But if you persist, and let me tell you, I mean, and I don't have to tell you this, Sean, because you've been you've been at this rodeo for as long as I have, if not longer. We've had this conversation for over a decade. And um, Christopher Yuan and I have been in many, many meetings with people who think very differently than I do. And what I'm very concerned about is um, if you persist in denying people the opportunity to repent when their sin is beatable, you are doing Satan's work. Mm. That's all, that's all, there's mm. no other way to put it. And if you keep doing Satan's work after you've been told that you're doing Satan's work, uh, that is a very serious matter. Mm. And what it, the serious matter is ultimately a denial of the articles of faith. And if you deny the articles of faith, you are committing heresy. And I know those are big words and, and everybody, I, but I'm a wordsmith. I'm trying to just break it down into its logical bite-sized pieces and share with you my heart, which is when I was really battling my homosexuality, I didn't have a pastor who came to me and said, you're a gay Christian, don't worry about it. It's not sin. It's just who you are. It's a little bit like left-handedness, you know, it's, or, you know, some kind of, you know, deafness. Don't worry. If that happened, I am fully confident I would not be talking to you today because I would not be a Christian because wow. that sin would have beaten me down. You see, a Christian is not a sinless person. My goodness, go ask my children. A Christian is not a sinless person. But a Christian is a person who repents of sin, who knows what sin is, 
and repents of it. And this, I, I think you wrote, did you not write a book on apostasy? I thought you wrote a book on faith deconstruction. I haven't read it yet. Uh, I want to. It's not so much on apostasy. We address a little bit of apostasy. We, okay. talk, we write a book for those who are deconstructing in the sense of how do I stay faithful to scripture and to Jesus amidst okay. asking questions. And one thing to oh. avoid is yeah, heresy, okay. but it's not really about yeah, yeah. apostasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a good book that I've just, I mean, I just think this book is terrific. It's called The Pilgrim's Regress, Guarding oh, yeah. Against Backsliding and Apostasy in the Christian Life by Mark Jones. And, um, and so it talks about, you know, how if you are denied the opportunity to repent, you're you're not going to you're not going to make it. I mean, mm. and, and so I, I wonder, again, you know, as, as a person who studies the history of ideas, as well as a person who's obviously unleashed a lot of bad ideas into the church and feels guilty and repentful of that. Um, I, I do wonder if part of why we are seeing uh, God not blessing us is any culture that is growing in its homosexuality and transgenderism is a culture that's judged by God. It's that's judgment. That, that's not a sign that we're being, you know, gracious and kind. And we're, we're, we have this wonderful sure. new people group that we can just embrace and welcome as is and, and try to build the fruit of the spirit on top of this, uh, this, what this beast uh, to be, to be in rebellion against the created order, it tears a person apart. Mm. But also to be sinning at the level of, of uh, 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 an internal temptation, that's what the 10th commandment is about. You know, and it was very, it was kind of shocking to me to realize, wow, there's a whole commandment that helps me I mean, you know, helps. At that time I wasn't feeling very helped, but you know, that, that, sure. that, mm. that, that kind of, focuses my attention on my homosexual desire. Okay, this is super helpful. And I think it's going to help people understand why you feel such a sense of urgency at this and what you see is at stake. And you lay this out very clearly in your book, which Good. I appreciate. There's a lot of people who may agree or disagree with you, but you're laying out what you think and kind of forcing people to wrestle with some of these ideas. Let me push back a little bit here for clarity with a mm -hmm. quote that you have. You said, mm -hmm. Biblical, biblically speaking, the sin of homosexuality is a verb, not a noun. It mm -hmm. manifests itself in either action at the level of desire or practice or both. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you kind of answered this, but flesh okay. out is homosexual desire itself sinful or just the action? And how do you see that comparing to heterosexual desire and sinful action? That's a great question. It, the way the Westminster Confession frames it, and I think this is really helpful, is that in desire is a motion. Desire isn't a, a passive, the kind of like comatose okay. state, okay? And because because we are morally responsible for our fallen nature, okay? Mm -hmm. The sin of Adam is Rosaria's to fight against. Um, it is not someone else's. God did not give this to me. I love it. I, that, I re and, and, that, and my loving of my sin, my, my um, you know, yeah, my loving of my sin, and so insofar as the motion of the desire of it, is itself a sin. And so the sin of that is what the, um, it, that is what the 10th commandment speaks to. Coveting is loving that which God has told you no to, even though it feels really natural. And then in a book called The Doctrine of Repentance, I, I don't know how to do this screen. It's mm. like, it's You're like we're sitting fine. in front of a mirror yeah. here. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, he, he says something that really, hit me between the eyes. He said, loving a sin is worse than committing it. Mm. Now you might say, whoa, 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 that's mm. just not true. Um, and what he goes on to say is the reason loving a sin is worse than committing it is, um, he says, to love sin shows that the will is in sin 
and the more of the will there is in sin, the greater the sin. Willfulness makes it a sin not to be purged by sacrifice. And so that kind of turns the tables on this idea that, um, you know, if if you um, act physically, like you you have homosexual sex, that is worse than having the desire for it. Now, I would say that obviously having homosexual sex is probably in my life, when I look back on my life and the sins that I've committed in my life, and I've committed a lot of sins. So I'm 61 mm -hmm. years old, I've accumulated a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Homosexual sex is a, if you really wanna hate your neighbor, that's what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. Because it, um, you know, it, it sort of captivates another person. And usually it would be a person you claim to love and yet you are you are really violating that person. And so the difference between now heterosexual, you know, sin is is vile and disgusting. And if you don't repent of it, you'll go to hell. I mean, <laughs> bottom line, it's not a, it's not a free pass. There's a difference. And this is where um, Murray and his commentary on Romans is extremely helpful, extremely painful for somebody like me to have read the first time through. And it, it basically, the, the summation is this, heterosexual sin is a sin against practice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, adultery, pornography, it's a sin against practice, but homosexual sin is a sin against pattern and practice, which um, Murray will say, and other reformers will say, that, that um, put it at a deeper level of, and they use this word, and it's a hard word to hear, degeneracy. Hmm. And so it, it is a serious matter. And because it is such a serious matter, it is not a matter of pluralism. It is not a matter of live and let live. Um, the moms and the, you know, the grandmas that I talk to, who have children who are um, you know, prodigals in somewhere in the LGBTQ plus movement, the, the fear is not only that they have an indwelling sin pattern, um, like any other one, pick it, you know, I don't know, lying, stealing, you know, but also that their indwelling sin pattern has a civil rights authority to it. And I am absolutely convinced that should Jesus tarry, these days that we live in today will be remembered in the infamy of Moloch. Hmm. And that's, wow. uh, and so, it, you know, so for a Christian to be of any use to a parent who has a child who is lost for now in this LGBTQ plus movement, you have to know firmly what you believe. And, and my encouragement is that you will encourage those parents to stay deeply connected to their children um, as they're able. You know, sometimes the children will give you the blackmail, but, you know, you just keep trying. You keep, you, you know, I mean, I will tell you that I, there are times when in my early life and meeting Ken and Smith, Floy Smith, I, I tried to disappear and Ken and Floy were not exactly stalkers, but they came very close. <laughs> they did not let go of me. And parents, don't let go of your children. But the other thing you need to do is retain your child's history. Keep the pictures, the baby pictures, the clothes. If you have to go buy a pod and put it in the backyard, do it. Because one of the, one of the, um, one of the ethos of LGBTQ plus is that you are reinventing yourself. And parents, if you can remember and retain that child's history, um, that that's that's going to be powerful and they're going to need that someday when they come back that's going to be part of the trail that they're going to use to remember how much you love them and who they are who they really are hmm. so don't make a false peace um make you know have real love and real connection but not a false peace that was helpful at the end of the book to stay in contact in relationship with kids mm -hmm. uh that transgender ideology denies both truth and history and to not lose that mm -hmm. truth or that history. 
-hmm. Let me come back to my question before. I'm curious how you would answer this. You made a distinction sure. between homosexuality and heterosexuality. Heterosexual mm -hmm. sexual behavior is a violation of practice, mm -hmm. uh, but not in terms of what was the word used? Not just practice, but pattern. in terms of pattern. Okay. Pattern. Homosexuality is practice and pattern. Mm -hmm. What about somebody who's married to the, somebody of the opposite sex? They're attracted to somebody else of the opposite sex, not their wife. If mm -hmm. they engage in that, it would be both practice and pattern according to God's creation account, right? In the same well, way. We're using pattern differently. Okay. I suspected that's what what, yeah, what you would say. Yeah. Flush that out with right. that difference. Okay, is. sure, sure. Pattern and, and I and I think this is a really interesting question. I'm really glad you, you raised it because I, in general, I don't think Christians were ready to defend the gospel at this in some ways kind of low level. Like we were ready to defend the gospel in terms of, you know, the resurrection of Jesus and to learn. No, you have to really defend it at the level of the ontology of male and female. I think we were like, oh, really? Okay, all right, I'll get there. Um, but Genesis 127 makes it clear that you are ontologically male and f male or female, and you are ontologically male or female for a creational purpose. And so heterosexual sexual sin, you know, is still heterosexual sexual sin. It is still sin and it is a terrible rotten sin and you will go to hell for it if you do not repent yep. and all of that. So we are not minimizing it, but it is still sin at the level of practice because the pattern is still uh, is still heterosexual, male and female. And, okay. and I guess let me add one more thing just to kind of wrinkle this up just because we don't have enough complexity here. And, and I, I do, I really, <laughs> I mean, I think about this all the time. I mean, so I do, do I. think that are you right? I'm sorry. You know, we're just, I, I had too much coffee today. Sorry about that. This is going to be bad for both of us. Um, but, you know, I would say add one more thing to just make this complex. The sin that we commit as Christians, like the sin we commit as people who know Christ is a greater sin than the sin that an unbeliever commits who does not know Christ. Mm. And so that's the other reason why Christians who claim you know, t to proclaim Christ to the world must do it rightly because um, you're handling the most important treasure that exists. I mean, there's nothing more precious than the gotcha. gospel. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to probe a little further for clarity. So okay. somebody like, well, take myself. If I were attracted to somebody of the opposite sex, not my wife. Mm -hmm. Say there were a desire there, but I didn't act sin. on it in, well, That's a say, sin. okay, so a, so an attraction to somebody, because not Because he's not, she's wife. not your wife. Yeah. Okay, that's so, a sin. and that's a sin in practice, but not in pattern. That's correct. Is that right? That's correct. That is correct. But it is still a sin to desire anyone who is not your I mean, this sounds like i'm rebuking you and i don't mean it in that way but no you know no what I'm no I, I and meant, i'm a biblically married person too so yeah to desire anyone who is not our spouse is a sin and you know what god and you know i mean you know we've all i'm I, I well let me put it this way i have been biblically married to my husband kent butterfield for almost as long as i have been a christian mm. which has been god's one of god's probably God's greatest earthly blessing to me. Why am I here and not someplace else? Probably because of that. Because I am married to an amazing, wonderful husband who was tender and gentle with me and with whom I could work out a lot of stuff. But to claim that it wasn't, to claim that desiring anyone that isn't your spouse is anything I mean, to claim that I'm going, to, I'm going to get my double negatives mixed up. Yeah. It's sin. Let me put it this way. It's sin. Okay. And, and you have to repent of it quickly. But if it is, if, if it is a, a, a heterosexual desire, it is a sin. It is still a sin. But it is not a sin against the pattern because the pattern I'm talking about is male and female. Okay. Is attraction itself a sin? If you look out and go, wow, that person, the opposite sex, 
beautiful, good looking, attractive, but you wouldn't quite say, oh, I have a desire for that person, but mm -hmm. you recognize mm -hmm. a certain beauty and attraction. Is there a difference sure. with heterosexual sure. and homosexual attraction on that level that one has to repent of and the other doesn't? Yeah, well, here's the deal. Same-sex attraction is a synonym for for gay. So if somebody comes to me, if, and this happens a lot, you know, people will come to me, come to the church and say, Rosaria, I struggle with same-sex attraction. I can guarantee you that that woman is not saying, you know, I'm a gymnast and I really appreciate a particular move on that gymnast. You know, that's not what she's saying. She's saying, I, it's crossing a line. I know it shouldn't. What do I do? So yes, I would say that attraction can have absolutely the inordinance of the motion of sin. And it is especially so in a homosexual context. But yes, I would say the same thing. If you tell me that you're attracted to some lady named Jill at the, you know, the gym and, you know, one of the ways that you're going to um, be good and godly is to kind of lean in on that attraction and steward that attraction for the glory of God. I will rebuke you soundly, sir. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. I, in some ways, we're nuancing this to death, but sometimes I'll say to my wife, we'll have conversations. I'm like, hey, which, which star do you think is most handsome? You know, we're yeah. some, like we'll have conversations and I don't think yeah. there's anything wrong with recognizing that insofar as it goes without taking the step that you go. I uh, think but, that's true. But is that if somebody has that attraction to the same sex, you would say that is a result of the fall. And although the person didn't choose that attraction, still needs to repent of that attraction in principle. Is that fair? What I'm, what I'm saying is that whenever anybody comes to me and says, I have same sex attraction, that person is talking not simply about an aesthetic appreciation of, um, I don't know, a chiseled jaw or something else, okay. <laughs> but a, uh, but rather a, um, a lack of a kind of sad sense of unfulfillment mm. that I can never be mm. with that person. And, mm. you know, and this is where it might be really helpful to say something really stupid and obvious, but I'm, you know, old. And that is that men and mm. are men and women are women. And so, you know, the question of dealing with homosexual desires for men and dealing with homosexual desires for women, it's both sin. But I want you to know, I think it is a lot easier for women to deal mm. with this. And certainly it was for me. And I will tell you why. And this is so old fashioned, that, you know, that you'll just have to find. Now we'll nuance something else to death here. But um, but. I do believe that women's sexuality is responsive and, and men's sexuality mm. is initiative. Mm. And if you are struggling, you know, if you are repenting of the sin of homosexuality and you are biblically married, you will learn a lot by responding to what is good. I mean, don't you teach that for your children? Teaching your children mm. to respond to what is good helps them love what is good. And so in my own case, having a husband to whom I could respond to what is good helped me to love what is good. I think it is a lot harder to initiate than to respond. Mm. And you know what? I'm not a psychologist. I don't play one on TV. So I have probably entered into a terrain that you and I will both wish I had never opened my mouth for. But I want to just say that because I don't think... I really genuinely don't think that your Christian life is measured by your feelings. Hmm. I think your Christian life is measured by how much you are in grace and in faith sacrificing for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we know that while progressive sanctification is progressive, we know that it's never going to be enough this side of heaven. And so because of that, the church does need to function like the family of God, because in Providence, some people will be single and those people need to know that they have always a place to belong on, you know, not just every holiday, but every day that they're beloved and they're needed. 
But what we don't do as a church is we don't say that the anomaly needs to renorm the norm in order to show respect. In other words, I don't believe that a church that grows in singleness mm. is a good thing. Nor do I believe that because you experience the sin of homosexual temptation, that means that you're called to celibacy. Um, now, you're called sure. to obedience. You're called to obedience yeah. because everybody's called to obedience. But my goodness, if you really believe that um, the only way people can be biblically married is if they don't have any kind of indwelling sin, talk to your own parents. You know, like just everybody has to deal with that. Um, but we are to be sensitive, but we are not to let the anomaly, which in this case would be singleness, norm the norm. In the same way that we're not to let the anomaly, which would be something like gender dysphoria or transgenderism, norm the norm. That's mm. barbaric. I mean, you know, really, and, and I think part of how we got there is the empathy trap. The idea that the highest form of kindness you can give to another human being is to stand in their shoes. Well, it depends. I mean, if you're at a funeral, definitely. But if I'm drowning in the river, don't jump in and stand in my shoes. No, it's not. It's not toxic masculinity to, um, you know, fix my life. Oh, for a second, it was cutting out. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, are I we can back? hear you now. Okay. All right. We, we got you. Well, okay. we are still on lie number one. This is what happens when you get an English professor and a philosophy major. <laughs> but these particular things are really important and often not handled with enough care. I think an assumptions are made there. So right. let me ask you, let me ask you one, right, one last right. question and then, and then we'll wrap up. I imagine some people would say, okay, okay. Rosaria, some people are born with same-sex attraction, didn't choose it. Uh, how do we mm -hmm. tell them to repent of something they didn't choose without shaming mm -hmm. somebody who often already feels so much shame and as an outsider in the church as it is? What does that look like? In other words, right. as a whole, really the question is, yeah. how can the church better love people with same-sex attraction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one is we don't think of them as people with same sex attraction. We think of them as people. And as mm. people, every person who walks through the door mm. is going to track in a lot of mud on their shoes. Okay, it doesn't matter. It, there's nothing the, the 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 sin of um, the sin of homosexuality, the sin of um, homosexual temptation is no different, theologically speaking, than any other sin. Like any other sin of the flesh, it is found in the flesh, it is forbidden in the law, and it is overcome in the Savior. That is true for homosexual desire, as it is for lying and cheating and stealing. But here's how the church needs to be very careful. Homosexual temptation is the only sin that comes with two things, a civil rights movement that says, no, you're fine the way you are. You just need a sticker in a parade. And by the way, it'd be great to castrate your 14 year old. No problems. They'll be happy forever. Um, or a heretical gay rights movement within the church that, that denies you the opportunity to repent of your sin when you have half a chance of beating it. Mm. And so I would say this, Sean, if you're in a church, a real church, everybody is repenting of something every day, all the time. And if you don't have a running dialogue, if you don't really know how people struggle or what they need, that's a, that's a, a, a kind of dysfunction at the level of community that needs to be resolved. A, a church is not, um, you know, we're, we're, we're serious about wanting to grow in Christ. We, and we're serious about knowing that God's will for our life in the Bible is twofold. We are to grow in sanctification and pray that our faith faileth not. And that's true for everybody. But I don't, I'm not a Freudian and I'm not a side B gay Christian advocate. I think those are category mistakes to say mm. that, um, that being born with same-sex attraction makes you a victim. 
No, being born in sin. You're not born with sin. You're born in sin. Psalm 51 makes that very clear. And that is the most democratizing principle in all of scripture. And um, and helping people to, to fight that sin and to grow in Christ is an enormous gift. How grateful I am that when I stepped through the door of a church in 1999, nobody told me I was a gay Christian and I please help the church better understand what homosexuality was like. No, they actually told me to repent of my sin and to grow in Christ and that born again Christians have victory over their sin. And one of the first things I did when I joined the church was I started meeting with Floyd Smith every week to try to learn about godly womanhood. And those were so helpful. I had no idea. I, it was sort of ironic that I was a professor of women's studies, but I didn't understand why God made women or what women were for. Or, um, I mean, I had never held a baby. I, there's all kinds mm. of things that were just not, I was 36 years old. And so it was, I'm so grateful that I went into, uh, you know, the Lord brought me providentially to a church that knew that born again Christians have victory over their sin homosexuality is not different from other sins. It's not a special category that renders it a non-sin. Um, and, and I've seen people have victory. And you know what? I've also seen the church rally around people for whom mm. the struggle is just deep and hard and long. And so you rally around those people. Absolutely. You know, Rosario, I've heard our mutual friend, Christopher Yuan, say to me one time, he said, you know, sometimes people will come to me and say, I've got, a, like pastors, I've got a, a, a congregant in my church who's wrestling with same-sex attraction. I can't help him, can you? And his point was that we buy into certain ideas that were really come more from critical theory and or intersectionality that our differences divide us more than our commonalities do. What you're right. arguing, you're saying is, hey, we all have struggles, we all have sin, we've all been born into sin. You said it's the great equalizer. This mm -hmm. one of my colleagues at, at Biola, Thaddeus Williams, has written a great book on mm -hmm. critical theory. And he says, where it falls short is you can't divide the world up into the oppressed and the oppressor. The Bible says we are all sinful oppressed mm -hmm. and oppressor all need to repent. Absolutely. So that's a that's a really helpful point. Now I've got to let you go because you got to go to Costco. I've got to go coach <laughs> my 11-year-old son's fifth grade right. team. I have pushed this and nuanced it. My listeners are probably not used to quite this much nuancing, but these are questions that I had. These are questions I'm trying to work through. I mm -hmm. really enjoyed your book. I don't know if I agree with you on everything yet. I'm not sure I'm working it through, but I can tell you I read it and I stopped many times. I went to my wife I'm, hey, and I said, what do you think about this? Would mm -hmm. you interpret it this way? And it really created a great ongoing dialogue between the two of us. Again, the book is called Five Lives of Our Anti-Christian Age. And I want to recommend it to viewers to check out, to read with, interact with it. If you end up disagreeing, you have been forced to think and go back to the scriptures mm -hmm. and conclude why, which is, I know, a lot of the heart behind your book. Before I let folks Absolutely. go, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other conversations coming up you will not want to forget. And also hope, if you've ever st thought about studying apologetics, consider studying with us at Biola. We have a full distance program, students all around the world. In fact, I just taught a class recently on a biblical view of sexuality. So we talk about the resurrection, evidence for intelligent design, problem of evil, and a biblical view of sexuality. Information is below. Rosaria, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Thanks for letting me probe and push and try to get clarity on some issues. And I hope we can do it again soon. I would love that, Sean. Thank you very much. You bet.